Tonight, day one of two high-profile court cases. Trials begin for the leaders of the Freedom Convoy and a man accused of killing a Muslim family. The not guilty plea to terror-related murder charges. Our hope is that in the end, justice will be served. And the push to hold protest organizers accountable. It was devastating for people socially, mentally, financially. A CTV News investigation reveals nearly 1,300 ER closures nationwide. Every closure runs the risk uh, of a bad outcome. Emergency care too often denied in Canada's rural communities. Plus, students looking for A's with the help of AI. I feel like people shouldn't do it. The new lesson plan as kids head back to class. I'm excited for learning. I mean, I'm kind of nervous. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. In two cities 800 kilometers apart, trials began in separate cases that had ramifications nationwide. One in Ottawa involving leaders of the so-called Freedom Convoy. We'll get to that in just a moment. But we begin in Windsor, where a 22-year-old accused of killing four individuals from three generations in one family, all Muslim, pleaded not guilty to terror-related murder charges. CTV's Adrian Gobriel leads us off. A callous crime that shook the country. June 6, 2021, five family members from London, Ontario's Muslim community are allegedly targeted for their faith while out for a walk by a young man behind the wheel of a pickup truck. Nothing could have been more tragic than this act of violence. That was... Nathaniel Veltman pleaded not guilty today as the trial began with jury selection. Scheduled to last 10 weeks, the trial has been moved to Windsor, Ontario, though the reason for that decision is under a publication ban. That didn't stop Muslim leaders from gathering outside the courthouse today. It is of utmost importance that these trial proceedings act as a serious deterrence for the kind of heinous violence we saw. The now 22-year-old is facing four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder in an alleged act of terrorism. The unthinkable violence that the family faced should be a marker for the entire country. Salman Afso, his wife Mediha Salman, their 15-year-old daughter Yumna and her 74-year-old grandmother Talat Afso were all killed. A young boy, now 11 years old, is the lone survivor. Islamophobia is real. Statistics Canada's most recent data shows that there were 3,360 hate crimes reported in 2021, a 27% increase from a year earlier. It is first and foremost a moment of serious soul-searching for us all. What has happened to Canada? Following the deadly incident, the National Council of Canadian Muslims released a list of recommendations to fight anti-Muslim hate across the country. The association believes each level of government have yet to fulfill their commitments. As for this trial, concerns are mounting that it will re-traumatize a community still fearful for their safety. Our hope is that in the end, justice will be served. When speaking to the media, the National Council of Canadian Muslims have declined to name the accused, saying they want this trial to remain victim-centric so the public doesn't lose sight of the four family members who lost their lives. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Two Freedom Convoy leaders on trial in Ottawa sat quietly in court today during opening arguments, a stark contrast to a horn-blowing protest that shut down the Capitol last year. CTV's Judy Trin was also in that courtroom. Ms. Leach, how are you feeling today? Good, thank you. Freedom Convoy organizer Tamara Leach, a grandmother from Medicine Hat, gets her day in court more than 18 months after she was first arrested. On trial beside her, Chris Barber, a truck driver from Swift Current. Excited. The two are facing multiple criminal charges, including mischief, obstruction of police, and counseling others to commit mischief and intimidation. Central to the case are three words echoed by Leach during her arrest. Hold the line. Hold the line. Hold the line. Hold the line. 
The protesters call it a rallying cry, but the Crown alleges it was a call to break laws, that Leach and Barber encouraged thousands of supporters to ignore police warnings even after a public order emergency was declared. In his opening statement, Crown Attorney Tim Radcliffe said the Charter does not give any person the legal right to unlawfully trample the rights of others. Not only did protesters hold the line for weeks as directed by Mr. Barber and Ms. Leach, they crossed the line. The defense insisted Leach and Barber set out to organize a peaceful protest and push back against the Crown's characterization that it was an occupation. Particularly at this time when there are Ukrainians under, our, under real occupation, it's an insult to them and anybody else who survived an occupation to be calling what happened here in Ottawa an occupation. The Crown's case is built on more than 100 pieces of evidence, including videos, social media posts and emails. About 20 witnesses will testify. Ottawa's former mayor says the Freedom Convoy turned more than 10,000 downtown residents and business owners into hostages. It was devastating for people, both you know, socially, mentally, uh, financially for the small businesses, uh, taking over the downtown core. The defendants say they had the right to protest vaccine mandates, but the Crown says this trial is not about their political motivations. It's about the means they use to achieve their goals. Omar. All right, Judy Trin in Ottawa tonight. In the U.S. Capitol, the former leader of the far-right Proud Boys has received the longest sentence of any defendant so far in the January 6th attack, 22 years. Enrique Tarrio was one of four Proud Boys convicted of seditious conspiracy in May. He wasn't even at the riots, but prosecutors say he used his influence to plan and orchestrate the events, acting as a, quote, general rather than a soldier. Back in this country, the point of a publicly funded health care system is that it's there when you need it. But as CTV News investigation reveals, a lot depends on where you live. People outside of cities are far more likely to arrive at an emergency room only to find the doors shut. As part of our critical care series, CTV's medical specialist Avis Favreau looks at the divide and the desperation. This fight at a party is an example of why emergency doctors and nurses are worried. Three teens were stabbed and driven to the emergency in Clinton, Ontario, just two kilometers away. When they arrived, they found it was closed for the night, with just a phone to call 911. We're playing Russian roulette here. Sooner or later, something's going to happen and it's going to cost somebody their life, and it came close this time. The victims ended up in two hospitals 20 and 80 kilometers away, and they survived. But it's a new trend among rural hospitals in Canada, with CTV News conducting a survey of provinces and territories, finding this year so far there have been over 1,280 times that hospitals, mostly rural, have closed their doors overnight for a full day or longer, usually because they can't find enough nurses or doctors. Every closure uh, runs the risk uh, of a bad outcome for somebody. It's not okay. Under any circumstance, it's not okay. This hospital in Chesley, Ontario, has been closed over 150 times this year alone, leaving patients like Reverend Craig Bartlett feeling abandoned. This place is my primary health care provider. He has no family doctor, hasn't been able to find one in over two years, so this hospital is his lifeline. How do they think that this is improving my health care situation at all? Is it... It, it befuddles me and it boggles the mind. This adds time for travel, 30 to 200 kilometers to the next ER. It also adds to the risk of those who may be suffering heart attacks or strokes. I'm not sure if anybody's actually examining the, the harms that are coming from this. Dr. David Savage hopes to study the closures in Ontario and their effects. When your ER closes and, and patients can't be assessed, well, the possibility of, of a poor outcome or, or something being missed uh, goes up significantly. ER doctors and nurses tell CTV News they are frustrated beyond belief that provinces haven't appropriately planned and prepared by training staff and maintaining basic rural health care. So these kind of closures uh, mean that government has failed to meet their end of the social contract for Canadians in terms of providing them assured access to quality emergency care. 
And late today, Canada's emergency physicians told me they've been asked to present to the country's deputy health ministers next week, talking about a national forum to help solve the urgent crisis in emergency care. Avis Favreau, CTV News, Toronto. And a reminder, our Critical Care series continues through the week with special features on ctvnews.ca. That's where you will find a list of where the ER closures have taken place so far this year. For many parents in Calgary, the most pressing health concern right now is an E. coli outbreak traced back to a centralized kitchen that supplies meals to nearly a dozen daycares. 56 cases are confirmed and 15 children are currently in hospital. CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier has the details. Across Calgary, 11 daycares are closed after dozens of children showed up at hospitals over the Labor Day long weekend with E. coli infection. The ER was just packed with parents and kids dealing with the same thing. Katie McLean's daughter, just under two years old, is one of them. So is Sarah McDonald's four-year-old son, Lachlan. Watching these little kids for hours, um, they're in terrible pain. They're terribly ill. Alberta Health Services has linked the outbreak to the caterer Fueling Minds. It supplies food to the six Fueling Brains Academy locations and the other impacted daycares. At least 15 children have had to be admitted to hospital. We pay our daycares to keep our kids safe and it now feels like they weren't safe there. E. coli infection can cause fever, stomach pain and diarrhea. In serious cases, it can result in kidney complications and even death. If any parents see those symptoms, um, in their children, they need to take them to an emergency room immediately. Back in 2000, Walkerton, Ontario's water supply was contaminated by E. coli. More than 2,000 people became sick and seven died. Food safety experts are calling for more mandatory training for anyone who handles food commercially. Unfortunately, uh, here in Alberta, like many provinces, not everybody who handles food has to have certification. For now, staff are monitoring the 15 children with the most serious illness. Families hoping the infection runs its course without any serious complications. So the next few days are, are really, we're kind of on eggshells. He is looking better, but we need to clear this hurdle. In a statement, Fueling Brains Academy says it's deep cleaning its locations. Health officials say those closure orders will remain in place until the issues are resolved. Omar. All right, Bill, thank you. Voters in Manitoba learned today they'll head to the polls October 3rd. The 2023 Manitoba election campaign has officially begun. This will be Heather Stephenson's first attempt to win a general election since taking over from Brian Pallister. The progressive conservative leader is promising more tax cuts in hopes of securing a third term for her party, while NDP leader Wab Canoe is pushing for more health care staff and to become the province's first Indigenous Premier. Ontario's Premier today faced tough questions about his government's controversial Green Belt land swap deal and, under increasing political pressure to act, said the province will now reevaluate sites. Here's CTV Siobhan Morris on the review. Why did you not prefer? After the Labor Day resignation of his housing minister, facing pressure to reverse course, the Premier announced a study. We're going to do a complete review of all lands in, in the green belt. This one right here. A requirement built into the legislation that established roughly 2 million acres of protected land in the early aughts. The review will go beyond parcels pulled from the green belt last winter. Not just the 14 lands, the seven or 800 applications. A process the premier says will be led by government officials and include consultation. We're going to make sure the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. We're going to make sure that there's merit to every application that comes forward. The opposition sees a revisit of what two watchdogs have called a biased, chaotic land removal process as a waste of time and money. This review is a sham. He can do what he needs to do right now. He just says it's all stopped. He can pause it. I think he needs to return it back. There's worry it signals open season on some precious land to build more. What I heard the Premier just say was that he's going to look at other developers' plans and, and reopen other opportunities in the Green Belt. He clearly doesn't understand how important it is to protect the farmland that feeds us. 
While an NDP strategist admits this review isn't one that will make everyone happy. At least can be one of those processes that has the light and transparency of a nonpartisan approach to it. The premier can't say how long the Greenbelt review under new housing minister Paul Calandra will take. When it comes to the lands removed from the Greenbelt last year, the premier still expects there to be shovels in the ground by 2025. We'll get our first look at the new housing minister at a news conference on Wednesday. Siobhan Morris, CTV News, Toronto. The prime minister began a crucial six-day trip to Asia aimed at expanding trade ties. His first stop, Jakarta. Justin Trudeau landed in the Indonesian capital with his eldest son. Canada named an Indo-Pacific trade representative to help boost business in the region. The prime minister also brought a gift for the country's president, Joko Widodo. Canada basketball jersey. Team Canada's basketball jersey with the president's nickname on it. Jakarta is where Canada's men's team qualified on Sunday for the Paris Olympics. And they'll play for a spot in the Basketball World Cup semifinals in Manila tomorrow. Time for a short break, but when we come back... She said to us, yeah, there's vomit in my seat. And we're like, that's what the smell is. Air Canada's apology after a passenger's disturbing discovery. Plus, remembering 70s hit singer Gary Wright. We are hearing tonight from a witness who says she was disgusted by the way two Air Canada passengers were treated on a recent flight from Las Vegas to Montreal. They were booted from a packed plane for refusing to sit in seats with remnants of vomit. Here's CTV's John Vanavelli Rao. The incident happened as passengers boarded an Air Canada Rouge flight from Las Vegas to Montreal. A pair of women arrived at their seats when a witness says one of them immediately noticed they were wet and reeked of vomit. She said to us, yeah, there's vomit in my seat. And we're like, that's what the smell is. Susan Benson was seated behind the women who called over a flight attendant and were told someone had been sick on a previous flight. But the seats were left soiled overnight and not cleaned until the next day. In a widely shared post on Facebook, Benson wrote the women were told to mask the smell. The cabin crew placed coffee grinds in the seat pouch and sprayed perfume. The passengers argued they couldn't sit in such wet seats for the four-hour flight, but were told there were no other options. She's like, well, the flight's very full. I'm very sorry. Then after discussing the situation with a supervisor, the pilot came back. Just bent down eye level and said, you guys, you know, can leave the plane right now on your own or um, I will call security and they will escort you off the plane. And if that happens, you will be on a no-fly list. And she said, why? He said, you were rude to our flight attendant and... You're not taking this flight. Security then escorted the women off of the plane. Air Canada is now reviewing the matter, saying its operating procedures were not followed correctly. Adding, this includes apologizing to these customers as they clearly did not receive the standard of care to which they were entitled. The airline says it's been in touch with the customers who've not been identified. At least one expert says it's not an isolated incident, saying power trips by flight crews are a growing problem. We respect the pilots and the crew members, there's no question about it, but that is not a license to, to bully passengers. As for Benson, she thinks an apology from the airline is hardly enough. John Venavelli Rao, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead, gold medal credentials. Three Canadian Olympians become the first players signed in a new pro hockey league. Canadian energy giant Enbridge will soon become the largest natural gas utility in North America after a multi-billion dollar shopping spree in the U.S. Calgary-based Enbridge is buying three companies from Dominion Energy in a deal worth $19 billion. They include the East Ohio Gas Company, Questar Gas, as well as Public Service Company of North Carolina. In a statement, Enbridge says the acquisitions will extend and diversify its natural gas footprint. The deal is expected to close next year. Three Canadian gold medal Olympians became the first major players to sign contracts 
with the new Professional Women's Hockey League. The Ottawa franchise announced three-year deals for forwards Brienne Jenner, Emily Clark, and goaltender Emerence Mashmeyer. They've played pivotal roles on the international stage for the Canadian national team. Puck drop for the PWHL's inaugural season is set for January. And a sad note from the music world tonight. Singer-songwriter Gary Wright has died in Southern California after a lengthy illness. Dreamweaver was one of his biggest hit songs in the 70s. His son says Wright had been suffering from Parkinson's disease and dementia. Wright was 80 years old. After the break. It's important to understand that this is a tool, it's not a substitute. You still need to build out those skills. The growing debate over AI in the classroom as students return to school. If you're a parent who saw your children off to school today, you likely know that first day jitters are pretty normal. But this year, mothers and fathers are also feeling a bit jittery over the rise of artificial intelligence, which, as CTV's Heather Wright reports, can create opportunities to learn and also get around learning. A big day for some tiny learners. I'm excited to meet new friends. As students in most provinces head back to school. I just hope I have a good time and don't run into any problems. That's all I wish for. <laughs> There was excitement mixed with a few butterflies. I mean, I'm kind of nervous. Some already dreading the learning disrupting the fun. I want to make a lot of friends, play, but the work is what gets in the way. The school year has just begun, but some are already predicting big changes. It will be the first full year with artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT. For educators, I think that there is opportunities to leverage this for uh, for grading, for creating exams, for providing automated feedback. Ritesh Kotak is a technology expert who says if used properly, artificial intelligence can be a benefit to both teachers and students. This is a tool, it's not a substitute. You still need to build out those skills when it comes to research, writing, spelling, and grammar, and showing your work. At Toronto Metropolitan University, students are trying to find ways to leverage AI without breaking any rules. If it was like writing an essay about a specific topic, I would like kind of use it to help me like find some um, points to start with, but I'll like completely write the essay myself. Most schools have tools in place to detect work created with the help of AI, technology that is constantly evolving. I feel like people shouldn't do it, right? Just a startup idea, because I feel like here, like at university, they're trying to test your limits. And on the first day of school, no matter the grade. I'm excited for learning. The sky is the limit. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. They're adorable, and good luck to all the students on the new school year. That's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night, and see you tomorrow. CTV National News, Canada's number one newscast.